In 1777, Vermont created its own constitution, and in January of 1778, the state adopted it and declared itself a sovereign state, known as the Vermont Republic. In the constitution, Vermont became the first independent state in America to partially abolish slavery. A fine was created for anyone who carried a slave in or out of the state to sell. The Vermont Constitution reads, No male person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after he arrives to the age of 21 years, nor female, in like manner after she arrives to the age of 18 years, unless they are bound by their own consent. Although slavery was outlawed for adults, anyone under the age of 21 was still unfortunately susceptible to its grasp. One of those people was Dinah Matisse, a black slave. She was freed by her master in 1777, just two months before she could have been freed without her master's consent. Although Vermont was officially a free state for slaves, there were many people who did not agree with the legislature. In several communities, free black people were shunned and mistreated, as well as white people who were advocates of what the abolitionists believed. When the Missouri Compromise, a law that divided the nation into two groups, free states and slave states, passed into law in 1820, Vermont was so against its pro-slavery approach that every single Vermont congressman voted against the pro-slavery amendments in the bill. The Vermont legislature passed the following resolution. Slavery is incompatible with the vital principles of all free governments and tends to be their ruin. It paralyzes industry, the greatest source of national wealth, stifles the love of freedom, and endangers the safety of the nation. It is prohibited by the laws of nature which are equally binding on governments and individuals. The right to introduce and establish slavery in a free government does not exist. In 18th and 19th century Vermont, churches were considered the heart and soul of a community. Since everyone in the community came to worship, the churches gained a large amount of power over what the people thought and did. Because many churches in the North had a large number of Southern members, most of which believed in slavery, churches usually shunned those who spoke openly about their abolitionist views. Even though most churches were anti-slavery supporters, they believed that speaking out about the matter in that way was unpatriotic and controversial. An example of the church's discipline against abolitionists is Leonard Johnson. Johnson was an open abolitionist man who lived in Vermont and attended the Peacham Congregational Church. Even though Peacham was an anti-slavery society at the time, they still did not tolerate open abolitionists. Johnson got into a debate with another church member about abolitism, and as the debate grew longer and more heated, Johnson used an insult unworthy of a church member, according to Charles A. Clark's The Vermonter article about Johnson. Johnson was faced with a choice when words got out about his outburst. He could either formally apologize to the member and the church for his actions, or he could be forced out of church. The latter took place after Johnson stood by what he said and refused to apologize, and he was promptly kicked out from his church. But not for the insult. It was for arguing openly about abolition. In 1834, the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society formed. The purpose of the organization was to abolish slavery in the United States and to improve the mental, moral, and political condition of the colored population. The society didn't encourage slaves to revolt or run away, but for people to take a stand for the slaves in a civilized manner, fighting for slaves' rights with logic instead of rifles. They posted pamphlets, produced news articles, and held meetings regularly. The response from people who didn't agree with their viewpoints became violent like many other instances where citizens protested abolitionist speakers. Many citizens of Vermont had been against abolition from the beginning. Non-abolitionists voiced their opinion in a violent way. They threw riots, made threats, and protested violently at anti-slavery speeches. This was a common thing in the North. Every single northern state had such protesters. These protesters made it very hard for the abolitionist word to spread in the North. Since churches were usually unwilling to let abolitionist speakers use their premises, 
they had to look elsewhere for a place to hold their event. The public made it very hard for speakers to get any nice place to make their speeches, such as libraries and town halls, so events were often held outside, away from town, or in bars or taverns. The 1835 May Riot in Montpelier is a prime example. Samuel May, a Connecticut abolitionist and speaker, made a speech in Montpelier, Vermont. Forty civic anti-abolitionist leaders stood outside the building, throwing rocks and eggs at windows while May spoke in an attempt to stop or disturb the event. Afterwards, he was harassed by the mob as he left and was given several threats, advising him to leave town. When May began his second speech at a church, women were asked to leave, and a large mob charged May, only being stopped by the abolitionist colonel Jonathan Miller, a war veteran who threatened harm to anyone who touched May, and the crowd dispersed. Even though many people, especially blacks, were discouraged to pursue abolitionist speaking and writing, many prominent writers and speakers for the abolitionist cause arose from Vermont, such as Lemuel Haynes. Haynes was a black man who moved to Vermont as a young adult. He studied for the ministry, married a white woman in 1783, and was officially ordained in the Congregational Church in 1785. He accomplished many things as a minister. He tripled the size of his parish, earned a master's degree from Middlebury College, and Royal Tyler, a well-established intellectual, abolitionist, Supreme Court of Justice member and writer of the first American play, The Contrast, was his good friend. In 1814, Haynes gave a speech in Connecticut for more than 80 ministers, and Dr. Timothy Dwight, president of Yale, was moved to tears. He was what many considered to be a rarity, a white man with a black skin. Even though Vermont was a free state, all the people who didn't believe in abolishing slavery and the possibility of a slave being recaptured made Vermont a very dangerous place for a runaway slave. Even if they were technically free in Vermont, they could still be mistreated, hurt, or recaptured because of their skin color. Certain safe houses still existed around the state, although no organized paths, markings, or meetings existed. The only way slaves knew where to go was by word of mouth and letters of introduction from other supporters of freedom. Vermont was one of the biggest routes used to get slaves from the south to the free land of Canada, with an estimated 4,000 slaves traveling across the state from 1820 to 1860. There were two main routes for going up through Vermont and into Canada, the eastern route and the western route. Fugitives from Massachusetts would take the eastern route, often entering Vermont at Brattleboro, and were taken through Townshend, Grafton, Chester, Cavendish, and Woodstock. From Woodstock, they would travel through Norwick, Stratford, Post Mills, Chelsea, and Montpelier. The western route would come from New York and would start in Bennington. Then they would go through Manchester, Wallingford, Rutland, Brandon, Middlebury, New Haven, Virgens, Ferrisburg, and Charlotte, ending in Burlington. The common junction between routes was in Montpelier. From Montpelier, slaves went to Waterbury, Richmond, Williston, Burlington, then north to Canada. One of the most heavily used stations was the Rokeby Underground Railroad, then simply called the Robinson Farm in Ferrisburg, Vermont. Owned by the Quaker Robinson family, it has since been transformed into a museum dedicated to the Underground Railroad. The Robinson Farm helped hundreds of slaves reach Canada and was run entirely from friends and word of mouth. Finally, in 1843, after Frederick Douglass, the famous writer and speaker, visited Vermont to speak, Vermont passed a law forbidding sheriffs, bailiffs, jailers, constables, and citizens from detaining fugitives. This meant Vermont could now be a much safer state for runaway slaves and all black people, as the law keeps people from recapturing a slave once they step onto Vermont soil. Vermont played a big role in how slavery was perceived nationwide. The first state to abolish slavery, one of the most abolitionist state governments at the time, 
tremendous support for the cause from the citizens, even in the face of danger, and several figures who changed the course of history with their speeches and writing.